Hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> I'm Kringle the Snail here, and I want to welcome you to the Christmas Book Review Special. There is nothing like getting a little cozy, sitting around the fireplace, wrapping up in a cozy blanket, and reading some fairy smut. Isn't that right, kids? <laughs> <laughs> you dirty little perverts. This is the fourth and absolute shortest book in the Akatar series. And y'all have had a lot of mixed reactions about it. I've seen a lot of y'all's comments and people are saying that they either hated it or you should just skip it altogether. And I'm here to say, I don't know. I, I don't blame you. <laughs> but I don't know. I actually had a fun time reading this. I, I didn't think it was like a terrible book by any means, but it, I, I could see how it is really out of place and maybe because it doesn't really fit in the grand scheme of the whole series. What's involved here could have been built in the other books instead of it being this sort of one-off thing. So I could definitely see why some readers just might not be a huge fan of this one in particular. It's kind of random, but uh, also it's, uh, it's kind of a vibe. And I think that's this book's greatest strength. Vibes. And not just any vibes. Christmas vibes. Well, actually, it's solstice vibes, technically. But it's fun vibes nonetheless. So this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna hit you with a good old pro-con list, okay? We're gonna debate the pros and cons of this entry in the series. I'll talk about some of the other random thoughts that I had. And lastly, we're gonna talk about the parts of the book that will keep you heated up and toasty throughout the whole Christmas season. It's not the warm, fuzzy feelings of solstice, I can tell you that much. <laughs> Away! Pro. One of the things that I pointed out in my Aquar video was that there was a lack of immersive prose that SJM can dish out when she wants to. However, Aquar was so busy with the war plot that there wasn't so much time to just, you know, take things in and breathe a little bit. And sure, that makes sense. You know, war was imminent. However, that didn't stop him from for bing bong though, no. it's, it's another discussion. But I don't think that incoming war plot was enough to leave out immersion and moments of pause. As if SJM felt that too, this book immediately starts off with immersive prose about the descending winter. It's the first page. The first snow of the winter had begun whipping through Valaris an hour earlier. The ground had finally frozen solid last week. And by the time I'd finished devouring my breakfast of toast, and bacon, washed it down with a heady cup of tea. The pale cobblestones were dusted with fine white powder. Once, I had dreaded that first snow, had lived in terror of long, brutal winters. But it had been a long, brutal winter that had brought me so deep into the woods that day nearly two years ago. A long, brutal winter that had me desperate enough to kill a wolf, that had eventually led to me here, to this life, this happiness. You see that? Like, right off the bat, we're tiptoeing into the jacuzzi of pros, you know, get warm, slowly sink under the water level, and just get cozy, you know, wade around in the warmth a bit. This book already gives so much more time to the, just like, the musings and word painting of this world, which is something that I personally love as a reader. Let us marinate in your world a bit. Let us slop around in the mud like a Christmas pig. I know this series is more character driven, but anytime that it has moments like this, I really do appreciate that. Moments where we get to experience the beautiful scenery and the world around these characters. Con! This book is pretty random in the grand scheme of this series. I haven't read very many recent fantasy series, but I certainly haven't seen a series do something like this where it has one book that just drastically changes the tone and the pacing. It truly is like this book is the Christmas episode in this series. Sorry, Solstice episode. Because this is a pretty strange detour from what we've gotten in this series so far, I can understand why people may not connect with it or it may just seem really out of place. I mean, ideally, a new entry in a series should build off the previous in a meaningful way. Did this one do that? Um, I'm gonna argue yes, but I'm gonna get more into that a little bit later. At the very least though, I can kind of tell that SJM just had fun writing this book. Maybe it was just an opportunity to try something a little new with these characters. And if she had fun doing it, you know, I could respect that. Bro, this book made more space for character development, and I can dig that. I can dig on a little bit of character development. Oh yeah, hook me up with a nice warm mug of that character development. Sprinkle some marshmallows in there. Maybe a little bit of smut, perhaps? Which characters are developing, though? Let's start with Feyre. Now that things have settled from the war, she has some time to reflect on her new responsibility as High Lady. As she roams the streets, she now sees buildings and businesses that are unoccupied because of the owners who have fallen in the war. She sees the grief of her people and is bearing the burden of that. She also has time to re-explore her love for painting as well and seeks to find a way to give some of that back into her city. It's a sincere and logical step for Feyre's character 
following Wings and Ruin. Another character focus is Nesta. We see, or rather don't see, the state that she's in now post-war. Witnessing death of these people and the death of her father, she seems to have become numb and indulges in drinking and random bing bong just to fill the void. She's distanced herself from others and lives in some janky shack on the other side of the city. While we don't see a full arc from her in this book, we mainly get a snapshot of where she's at now. And I imagine this is mainly a setup for Silver and Flames. The more up close and personal time we spent with some of these characters was really necessary. Since Akawar, we needed to see what was boiling underneath some of these characters. Now this is something that kind of leads into my next con. The good elements of this book, the character development, the world building, is something that probably could or should have been involved in the previous or future books in the series. I know I'm really dogging on Wings and Ruins pacing a lot here, but I think cutting down on unnecessary bits really makes the difference between things just happening and meaningful things happening. Remember Brana and Dagden? Their inclusion in the beginning of Wings and Ruin is fine. It added some tension in the beginning, but in the long run, I, I wouldn't be mad if those characters were cut in order to make room for for some other stuff like the mirror of Ouroboros or learning more about Nesta, you know, stuff like that. I think the best this book has to offer in the series is that immersion in character development. And so it makes me wonder why it was sectioned off in this smaller entry instead of involving it into more of the meaningful books in the series. I do have a suspicion about why though. It's for those solstice vibes, baby. I think my enjoyment of this book relied a good deal on the fact that I read this right at the beginning of November. I cracked open this bad boy the minute the temperature started to drop. There was that chilliness in the air, the smuttiness in the air, it lined up perfectly. I was kind of surprised about how SJM was able to fit that Christmassy vibe into this world, <laughs> complete with gift giving, winter traditions, and even a nice holiday meal with the family. Faye and Rise are mom and dad. More Cass and Asriel are the kids. Elaine is that hot cousin, you know, that Asriel is, you know, having a hard time being around. <laughs> Things are getting a little confusing. <laughs> Amarin is the mean aunt with her new weirdo boyfriend. And Nesta's the drunk uncle. It all just fits so well. I gotta admit, it was kind of fun to just see how this fantastical world that she set up runs parallel with our experience with Christmas for a moment. So this indulgence and the warm, fuzzy Christmas vibes didn't really bother me that much because I think I read it at the right time. <laughs> but if you were reading through this series and you hit this part in the summer, yeah, I could see how that would be annoying. <laughs> Another reason why I wouldn't blame you for not connecting with the story. Some of you have commented that you should skip this one in the series, and I don't know how much I'll agree with you until I read Silver and Flames. If this has some crucial plot points in here, then yeah, you should read this book. But if the next book only almost goes over these plot points again in more of a concise way, then yeah, maybe you don't really need to read this. But hey, you know what? At least it's short. It's a little bit of a bonus pro for you. If you're skeptical about whether reading this book is worth it or not, at the very least, it's not like 700 pages or something. It's not a huge commitment. Because it was so easy to read, I just blasted through this one. Just, just blasted through it quickly. I read it fast. Beyond the vibes, there were some interesting ideas I wanted to point out here as well. Hear me out on this one. Faye cycles. <laughs> there is a part where Feyre is talking about how her experience of her cycle has drastically changed now that she is a Faye. And I was pretty shocked at this. Not so much that the book brought up like menstruation or whatever, but that it's like a fantastical version of what menstruation can look like. And I mean, I just got to say that is not something that has ever crossed my mind until now. <laughs> of course, it makes sense that it would change in some way way when she turns into a fae, when she is transformed into a magical being. <laughs> Apparently, instead of like getting her period monthly, it's now like a couple times a year, but extremely painful. <laughs> that honestly sounds like a good would you rather. <laughs> Stay human and have normal monthly periods or become fae, have extraordinary magical powers and your period comes twice a year, but it might just kill you. <laughs> Comment your answer below, huh? <laughs> Anyway, I just thought it was a fascinating idea and I never would have come across this if this was written by a man. <laughs> and it's also not like this idea is explored in depth in any way. It's more just kind of there, but it was more just the fact that I had never even considered something like this before. And it was interesting to come across. Another larger feature of this book that I liked was looking into the state of Nesta more. She probably remains to be the character that I'm still the most interested in because she has so much ground to cover from a character perspective. Most of the other characters are in pretty good spots, but Nesta has a lot of room to develop into something interesting. She's extremely selfish, mean, hardened, but from her relationship with Elaine, you can see that she has the capacity to love pretty deeply. Now that she has some crazy shockwave blast nest of rage powers, she could become really good at protecting the ones that she loves. It's just rough to see her in this state though, where she's just devoid of feeling and experience things just to feel something. I'm curious to see what kind of person she'll become in the future. One last thing about this book that I thought was really interesting is that it would often change perspective of the characters. So we can follow them for a bit and kind of just see what they're up to. I liked this and I think it would be really 
really good if future books incorporated more of this. I think sometimes the story could be a little locked to Feyre's perspective, and we have to do weird things in order to see what other characters are up to. Like in Wings and Ruin, when Nesta is fighting the King of Hybern. The only reason we saw that is that Feyre mind-melded with the cauldron, and the cauldron shot its consciousness over to where Nesta was fighting the king. It was certainly a creative way to show us that scene without Feyre being there, but I don't know, maybe the series would benefit a bit more from committing to follow different characters and their perspectives. I certainly felt this way about Lucian in Wings and Ruin. There was a long gap where he was out of the picture when he was trying to look for Vasa. And I don't know, maybe this could have been cool as a B-plot to follow him and his adventures. You know, I always wondered how Mr. and Mrs. Claus stay warm all year round at the North Pole. And, uh... I think I know how. It's because they got a huge shelf of smut up there, man. That's what they're doing all year round. Jeez. So we're going to take a page out of Mr. and Mrs. Claus's, you know, smutty books and uh, do how they do. Now, this is a pretty short book. It's not like there's a ton of spicy scenes in here or anything. Wings and Ruin obviously upped the frequency of the spicy scenes. But what this book doesn't do for quantity, it makes up for with intensity. And speaking of intensity, there's only one way I can talk to you about these scenes and it's by eating Hot One's hottest sauce and then recounting to you the, the hottest scenes. As a Christmas bonus, I gave you a, a little extra dab there, okay? I hope you're grateful. Have you been good boys and girls this year? Because, uh, well, Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. Oh, 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 this book starts off with Faye and Rice settling down after the war, and it's not like that stopped them from bing bong. Oh man, that was a lot. Oh, it occurred to me when I've done this before, I've done little dabs at a time. That one was a lot at a time. That, that really hits hard. Oh my gosh. So now that they got more free time, they're coming up with new and creative ways of binging the bong, if you know what I mean. Oh my gosh. Ah, uh, the bonus Christmas dab is... It makes it worse. It makes it worse. Ha! Ah. This is Ryze speaking, by the way. Last week, I had been so stupidly busy, and I had been so desperate for the feel and taste of her that I had taken her during the flight down from the House of Wind to the townhouse, high above Valaris, for all to see. If it weren't for the cloaking I had thrown into place, it would require some careful maneuvering. <laughs> flying sex. Yes, that's correct. They're flying and having sex at the same time. Do birds even do that? When you got these overly attractive fame males with massive wings that also apparently are a part of the sexual experience, the only logical conclusion was to start having them shacking it up in the skies. I don't know how I didn't expect this. Now as everyone is coming over for the souls to Eve, Elaine and Asriel, they be acting weird. The tension that's been building up in Wings and Ruin is still here festering like a Christmas rash. Sorry, solstice rash. Very different. Asriel emerged from the sitting room, a glass of wine in his hand, and Wings tucked back to reveal his fine, yet simple jacket and pants. I felt more than saw my sister go still as he approached. Her throat bobbed. I stirred in my seat, nestled between Amarin and, and more, in time to see Elena say to Asriel, oh, Hello. As said nothing. He just moved towards her, more tensed behind me. But Asriel only took Elaine's heavy... I can't even read! But Asriel only took Elaine's heavy dish of potatoes from her hands. His voice soft as night as he said, Sid, I'll take care of it. Elaine's hands remained in midair as if a ghost of the dish remained between them. With a blink, she lowered them and noticed her apron. I will be right back, she murmured and hurried down the hall before I could explain that no one cared if she showed up to dinner covered in flour and that she should just sit. I want you to understand how difficult it was to stay composed and read while my mouth is on fire like this. By the sheer intensity in which this interaction occurred, it's quite clear that these two are locked in that nebulous dance of feeling something for each other but not quite knowing how to behave normal in public. They're all bashful and stuff, it's cute. While those two are being a couple of cute baby angels subtly flirting, Amron and Varian, they're getting straight up nasty. Found Amberin in her loft an hour later. Rise had another meeting to attend with Cassian. My nose crinkled as I entered Amberin's toasty apartment. It smells interesting in here. Amberin seated at the work. Amberin seated. Amberin seated at the long work table in a. Oh my gosh. Amberin seated at the long work table in the center of the space gave me a slashing grin before gesturing to the four-postered bed. Ew, man. Come on. Getting freaking hot in this hat, man. Oh my gosh, dude, it's so sweaty in this hat. 
This place needs to be disinfected. The whole place. Just set the bed sheets on fire. Move the furniture out of here. The whole building's gonna be leveled. Don't worry about it. These two couples are the contrast between the cute couples that you love to see together. They're adorable. They're just glowing every time they're around each other. Whereas Aaron and Varian are the couple where you're like, can you please stop? Nobody appreciates what's happening here. This needs to stop, frankly, please. I'm concerned Varian has a Cthulhu fetish. Have you seen the way he looks at horrible leviathans? It's disgusting. Dude's a pervert. All of these scenes though are not that graphic. It's just a lot of that preheating. Things don't really get out of control until the spicy scene at the end with Feyre and Rise. And oh my gosh, this one hits different. This one is not like the spicy scenes before. Most of the spicy scenes in the series are, are really not that long and they kind of play out like something else normally would in another kind of book or story or tale. This one though, utilizes fantastical elements. More than the others, this spicy scene uses fantastical techniques into the sex. Remember the flying sex from earlier? No. Oh, sorry. Remember the flying scene from earlier? <laughs> nothing. That's nothing. That just scratches the surface compared to what's gonna happen here. I got, I just, I gotta take another hit for this one. Okay. Here it goes. My plan, he went on. The dress sliding from me to pull on the rug involved this cabin and a wall. Ah. Ah. Oh, man. My eyes opened just as his hand began to trace long lines along my bare back. Lower. I found Rise smiling down at me, his eyes heavy lidded, while he surveyed my naked body. Naked, save for the diamond cuffs at my wrists. I went to remove them, but he murmured, leave them. <coughs> and hailed a chip again. Do you want to begin at the wall or finish there? They begin to use the wall for purposes that I will not disclose. That poor wall. Okay, so so things progress. Da, say hello everybody to the next sweats. This might be one of the longest spicy scenes in the series so far. And it is definitely the most detailed and indulgent. Every little detail is very well documented. Oh, then, then, this is where the magic comes to, into aid in their, their ventures. Are you, are you ready? Feyre uses her abilities to go into to Rise's mind and see through his eyes and see what he sees. That is concerning. But then Feyre asks if they can bing bong in their mind meldiverse also. So they're getting fricked in reality and they're getting mind fricked. This continues until let's just say the integrity of the wall is worse off than where it was when they started. Pictures have fallen off the walls, wreckage is strewn around them. And then after a pause, Feyre tells Rise to do it again. And let's just say he's lock and loaded just like that. You're telling me that they could just bounce back on command? We need to thank the culture above that humans cannot do this. If we could, nothing would get done. There wouldn't be anybody out on the streets. We would have died out as a species a long time ago. We'd all be looking like Amron and Varian right now. Oh, even though this was more of a shorter and casual book, the spicy scene was not. It went hard, pun intended. And this makes me nervous for the next book, especially because of what y'all have been commenting. <laughs> I'm scared that this is just a foreshadowing. This is just a little taste, just a little dirty taste of what's to come. Huh? You get that? You catch that one? <laughs> <sighs> wow. What a spicy time, Santa. <laughs> Thank you for leaving some of your dirty books under the tree for us this year. That was a, that was a treat. <laughs> So I think there are valid reasons to like this book and valid reasons to not like this book. And I think the reasons are fair either way. The warm fuzzy vibes rubbed up all and down my cheek and it was, it, it felt, it felt good. I was reading it right as fall was really cranking into gear and you know, that was just the right vibe for me. It's short, it's cozy. Was the book necessary? Probably not. Was it fun? Yeah. Was it horny? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I really appreciate all of you spending your time to hear me talk about books or whatever else. It really does mean a lot to me that you have all watched my videos. Uh, I really did not expect that I would be uh, getting as many views as I am now. And it's, it's crazy. The Akatar video is at over 100,000 views, which I cannot even believe. Never even thought that that would happen. But you have all made that happen for me, which is an amazing Christmas gift. And I hope that this video is a nice little, you know, lump of coal you can just dunk in your stocking right there. I hope you all have a wonderful and restful Christmas 
this season. I got a couple more special videos planned, so you know, keep your eyes on the skies. You know, I might be coming by on a sleigh, you know, to drop a little, drop some goods for you. They're a little bit different. I'm really excited about them, but I hope you enjoy them as well. Once again, uh, I'm Kringle the Snail, and I'll see you the next time I'm out of my shell. Peace.